Welcome to the City Current Show. I'm your host, Andrew Bartolotta. We're always honored to bring you stories of individuals and organizations with inspiring stories, working to power the good in our community and around the globe. And today we're discussing catalytic leadership with Dr. William Attaway. William, thanks for coming on the show today. Andrew, thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Now, before we talk about your new book, give listeners an idea for your career as a leadership coach and in church ministry for almost 30 years. I went to my first leadership conference when I was 15 years old, and I was hooked. I've been a student of leadership since then. In working first in the corporate world and then in local church ministry for the last 25 plus years, I've had the opportunity to learn from and develop leaders in a lot of different contexts. And what the book is, is really an outgrowth of that. It's so many of the lessons that I've learned from other people and that I've learned as I've coached leaders over the last 20 years. Let's talk about Catalytic Leadership, your new book. What are some lessons or tips from the book that uh, readers can learn from? It's 12 principles in the book that, that are threads that I find often are recurring themes in my conversations coaching leaders. These are things that we, we keep coming back to, we circle through, and no matter their context, whether it's in business, whether it's in the corporate world, whether they're a, an entrepreneur, a solopreneur, a founder, or whether they're in local church ministry, these threads, these principles apply. They're consistent across all different disciplines. One of those, for instance, is, is the cultivation of a teachable spirit. That's maintaining a learning posture, right? If a leader stops learning, I would argue they stop leading. It's at that point that you, you no longer earn the right to be heard. We have to, if we're going to be catalytic leaders that inspire and ignite change, we have to continually be learning. That means we can learn from anybody. Sometimes we might learn what not to do, but I would argue that can be as valuable or more than a good example. I agree with that because we do learn from our mistakes or some uh, misguided ways that we may have. Mm -hmm. How important is a personal leadership growth plan? Well, you know, the old saw says that if you if you fail to plan, you plan to fail, right? And I think there's a lot of truth there. I think if we are intentional in our planning, we have a much higher likelihood of success than if we just try to wing it. One of the things I encourage leaders to do is to develop an intentional growth plan where you are going to plan out your growth intentionally going forward. These are the books I'm going to read. This is how many books I'm going to read, how often I'm going to read. These are the podcasts I'm going to listen to, to learn from people who are similar to me and who are different from me. If we're only surrounding ourselves with people who think and act like us, we're going to be surrounded by an echo chamber. And that's not where learning happens, right? Learning happens when we're challenged beyond our comfort zone. So it's the books you read, it's the conferences, the workshops you attend, the people that you learn from and listen to. All of these things are part of a growth plan. These are all ingredients in that soup that I think is necessary to truly be catalytic as a leader. Now you're talking about growth plans. Now let's dive into evaluation. You talk a lot about evaluation what does that entail and why is it so important? You know, there's this idea that experience makes you better. <laughs> and, and I push back on that pretty hard. I don't think experience makes you better at all. I think evaluated experience makes you better. There's a lot of people who have 30 years experience doing something. At least that's what it shows up as on paper. In actuality, what they have is one year experience repeated 30 times. They've just been doing the same thing over and over again, never learning from it, never really getting any better. It's just that one year of experience. I think through evaluation, we learn how to grow, how to get better. The team that I lead, I'm consistently asking them three questions as we evaluate, right? What, what, where did we get it right? What went right in this? Okay, where did we get it wrong? What went wrong here? And how do we make it better next time? What would we do differently? What would we do the same? How do we make it better? It's through those evaluative questions that I think the real magic happens. That's where the growth is. That's where we learn how to get better and how we take what we learn and then implement it in the future. Or how do you learn if a candidate is a right fit for your team? Mm. You know, that's, that's such a, a, a challenging topic. And I think a lot of people, particularly in the midst of what's been termed the great resignation, right, where we're always looking for the right people, not just warm bodies, but the right people. Um, there's a framework that I've been using for many years and I've customized and added to it in my own experience. I call it the five C's. And, and these are five things that I'm consistently looking for when it comes to people who are going to be a part of our team. I think you start with finding the right people that matters most. If one of those, for instance, is character, right? Uh, 
character matters a great deal, no matter what field you're in. I'm leading in the local church. Obviously, character matters there. But I think you can see in the news that character matters no matter your field, because we see a lot of leaders end up in a ditch, whether it's in the corporate world, in the government sphere, the social sector, the nonprofit, it doesn't matter. You can see leaders who ended up in a ditch because they thought character was negotiable. Character is not negotiable for a leader, particularly. Uh, a catalytic leader, character is number one. Uh, another one of those is chemistry, right? This person needs to have chemistry with other people that they're going to be working with, other people around the table. We've had candidates for positions who come and they tick off all the other C's and they got that, but they didn't have chemistry with the rest of the people. And that's a non-negotiable, right? I want that. That matters because this is somebody you're going to be working closely with. This is somebody that you want to enjoy spending time with. That doesn't mean you have to be best buddies, but there's got to be some chemistry there. Another one is competence. Can they do the job, <laughs> right? Now, that may be one that you're like, well, duh, of course. You'd be surprised. <laughs> sometimes sometimes we, we're willing to negotiate this one away. We think, oh, well, you know, it's not, not that big. Well, they'll, they'll grow into it. You know, we can get them there. There's a certain level of competence that is absolutely required. You must do this thing. Uh, that's why that makes one of the C's. Uh, this, these, are, these are things that, these are lenses that we look at candidates through to see, are they a good fit for our team, for this role, for this organization? Every organization has DNA. Every organization has a culture, right? And that's another one of the C's is culture. Are they a culture fit for us? And are we a culture fit for them? That goes both directions. You have to evaluate that. So going from candidates and prospective employees to your own leadership, how can you avoid the drift toward mediocrity in your leadership? The biggest way to avoid mediocrity is through intentionality. You have to choose. The natural tendency of any person, any individual, any organization, any team is to drift toward what's comfortable, right? But what's comfortable is not where growth happens. Mm -hmm. Growth always happens on the other side of change. And we tend to push back against that. We're like, no, 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 no. I can grow here where it's comfortable and I know what I'm doing and everybody is feeling good. Careful, careful. Growth always comes on the other side of change. And we have to bear that in mind. When we're intentional about this, when we say, I'm not going to drift, follow the natural drift into mediocrity, I'm going to continue to pursue excellence. That's an intentional choice. You decide that. You pre-decide that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to choose it. You can't wait until the moment happens. If you wait till the moment happens, you're going to go with the flow. And the flow is always toward mediocrity. Talk about how your older daughter's cancer diagnosis impacted your family faith and ultimately leadership. You know, I'm a planner. <laughs> I love to plan, live my life by a calendar. But in 2019, we got hit with something that was not on my plan. It was showed up nowhere on my calendar. My older daughter began to have headaches and it was ultimately revealed through after weeks of, of testing and examination that she had a, a tumor on the back right side of her brain. Uh, only about 50 teenagers a year in the world are diagnosed with this type of cancer that she had. Very unexpected. We didn't see this coming. There's no history of this. How do you deal with that? And what I discovered walking through that journey with her and, and as a family is that it's in those unexpected moments that you understand where your foundation really is, right? Where, where, what are the core values that matter most? And, and this is one of the principles that I write about in the book that family focus is an element of being a catalytic leader, understanding that, that you're not just who you are in the office. You're not just who you are at work. You are a fully orbed person, right? You have a lot of different parts to your life. We think we can wall off different pieces of our life and what happens at home doesn't affect what happens at work and, and so on around. The fact of the matter is those walls don't exist anywhere except in our imagination, right? Everything touches everything else. In the middle of, of my daughter's diagnosis, we, were, we struggled, we fought, but the foundation of faith that we had is what enabled us to take steps each day, one day at a time. The commitment that we had to our family is what carried us through these things. These are not things that we, that we discovered or established in that moment. These were established years, decades before this, but that's how we made it through that. Now, one of the things that the leadership principles that I learned in that season was something that we talk about a lot as leaders. We know intellectually that one day somebody else is going to sit in the chair I sit in, 
I'm not going to sit in that chair for the next 500 years. We know that intellectually, but we behave sometimes in ways that, well, we think we're the savior of the world and, and we're the only one that can do the job and we need to be there all the time. When you go through something like what we went through three years ago, you discover what really matters. And that helps to center and ground you. And during those days when we were evaluating this, trying to determine what, the, what, the, what type of cancer this was, what the plan was going to be, I was worried a whole lot less about what happens at the office. And I was worried a whole lot more about the relationships of those closest to me because that matters. And we did talk off air and she's doing, she's doing well, correct? She is, she's she is. She's three right. years out from that diagnosis. We had the treatment. She's doing great. The cancer has not recurred and we are so incredibly grateful for that. That is wonderful. Now, what advice, uh, being in ministry for over 25 years, I think it's it's unique that you have this business um, background and you have this ministry background and they can really uh, interweave together. Talk. What, what advice would you give for those that may say, I'm struggling in my leadership skills or in my career now, I'm making the jump maybe to a new career or would like to hone in on my leadership skills. What advice from a biblical point of view and a more secular point of view would you give them to inspire them? I would say it's the same piece of advice that, that comes from a biblical point of view that applies no matter your context. And that is that you are not created to do life alone. The, the fact of the matter is we're created to live in community with other people. There, there is this idea, this tendency within us to think we can just pull ourselves up and do everything ourselves. We've gotten it to this point, especially true with founders and entrepreneurs. They've built it. They've gotten it to this point. They can take it to the next level. And when they hit a wall, when they hit an obstacle, when it's time for a career change or something, then, then like, I'm not sure how to get past this. They hit something they cannot, they cannot overcome by willpower, by working longer and harder. And that's where I believe a coach is helpful because a coach is part of your community that you intentionally choose. Somebody who's going to come alongside you and help you see what you cannot see. They're called blind spots for a reason. The fact of the matter is you can't see the whole picture when you're in the frame. And what a coach does is ask you the right questions to help you see what you haven't been able to see so that you can intentionally deal with it and overcome it and move past it. That's the value of that. That is rooted in what we read about in the Bible. That is rooted in what we see in the secular workplace. The secular workplace has known the value of coaching for decades, right? Guess where that idea started? In the Bible. That's it. The yeah. idea that we are in community, we are with one another on purpose, for a purpose. None of us have all the gifts. None of us get it right in everything, every area, every skill, every talent. No, we need each other. And that's the beauty that. of people choosing to align with a coach. That's great advice. Great advice. What puts a smile on your face when you look back at the work that you've been able to do for so many individuals, companies, and in your ministry? I think when I see a leader get better and I see the trickle down effect, I see that begin to touch those they lead when they begin to see the people that they lead, not simply as cogs in the machine, but as individuals who have hopes and dreams. And they begin to leverage their relationship, not just to, to utilize them for their skills and their gifts and their talents, but to empower them, to equip them to lift. And that's leadership. That's the servant leadership that I know. That's what really undergirds all of catalytic leadership. And when I see leaders do that, that fires me up. That just gets me so excited. I love to see that. That's the payoff for me. I love it. Where can people go to learn more about you, your book, and support your efforts? You can go to catalyticleadership.net. That's the website. And you can learn more about the coaching that I provide there. And Andrew, for your listeners, I'd love to offer a free copy of the book. Uh, this is something I want to get to, into as many hands as I can because I believe this message matters. Uh, you can go to catalyticleadershipbook.com and you pay the shipping so I can get it to you and I'll give you a free copy of the book. That is awesome. What a great deal and a great message of, of leadership skills that people can learn and, and hone in on. Dr. Attaway, Dr. William Attaway, thanks for coming on the show today. 
thank you so much for having me, Andrew. I've really enjoyed my time with you. Thank you.